Well, I'll start. Okay, so um, this is a very rich and diverse set of topics which we're dealing with today. Um, and I can't really give you a coherent reaction, so I'll give you an incoherent one, which hopefully has nuggets of coherence in it. Um, we're really looking at all the ways that we've been looking at the historic Christian kingdom of Congo through archaeology, through um, linguistics, through oral tradition, and through the study of art, iconography, and symbolism. Um, and the Kingdom of Congo is, is really quite unique in the history of Africa um, in the sense that it's so well documented for such a long period of time. And not only is it documented from external sources, but also from internal sources, thanks to being a literate country as well as being um, a Christian one. And so we can draw on all of these, um, all of these components to get at what we want to, uh, to understand about the history of the Congo. <clears throat> so I think that probably for me, the most exciting part of this process was uh, the conversations that Kuhn and I had concerning the term Gangula. Um, not so much because we thought there was smoking gun evidence about uh, an Eastern origin in the Kingdom of Congo that simply came out of the studies of that word and its history, but also because it really did reopen um, a lot of discussions about how this country came together. Things that had been uh, overlooked or forgotten or displaced in our discussions um, in the past. And, and as Karen pointed out, the uh, Yantan kind of decisive intervention on the question of the origins of the Kingdom of Congo was anchored on the idea that there was a single correct story. And that this single correct story was the one that we needed to get our hands on and somehow reconcile all the others to it. Uh, and so, uh, proceeding that way, this is the way I, in fact, approached my own uh, intervention in this discussion in 2001, was uh, looking through the material to find that single story. But in fact, the single story, and probably the, the archetypical version of that was Kavatsi's version, uh, collected by him probably around 1650, uh, 1655 or so, uh, which talked about this uh, dynastic union Bata and Congo, and that dynastic union then becoming the basis for the kingdom. Uh, even at that moment, you couldn't help but notice that Bata was connected to something to the east, and it was only after a long struggle that we sort of realized that the, the so-called seven kingdoms of Congo de Anlaza might actually be a really important entity to deal with. Uh, and so I can't say that we have some sort of conclusion yet, but I, it, to me it's very exciting to have something reopened that uh, we all get to relook at everything we've been looking at to try to figure out exactly how um, pre-existing entities uh, came together. Just out of a matter of default, I think we all sort of believed that the Kingdom of Congo was the first uh, complex political entity in this part of Africa, uh, lacking the obvious underlying archaeological work that would tell us uh, something more about that. And so realizing this was really the important part. And what we were probably dealing with was the history of the dynasty rather than the history of the kingdom. Uh, and in a way, that's not surprising. Uh, one of the things that always struck me from the very beginning of my own research in Congo was the virtual um, disconnect between the modern day, that's to say, 20th century oral tradition and what you mean in the, in, the, in the record, even tradition reported in the record of the past, uh, and it tends to be connected to, to families or to clans, uh, rather more than to entities, per se. Indeed, probably the most, uh, the most, I guess you say, orally transmitted information that comes out of the oral tradition for the kingdom was the list of kings. I haven't said that, though I realized that the kingdom of Congo had an archive, and anybody compiling a list of kings could do so, and indeed, I was able to do so just on the basis of royal letters found in archives outside the country, where you would have, I think, a very close to comprehensive uh, king list, because most kings had ruled more than a few hours, um, and they were thus only ruled a few hours, um, wrote a letter to somebody somewhere. Uh, so uh, maybe that king list is really anchored on something like that. Uh, so that's sort of my introductory part on this section. Um, I was really fascinated, I have to say, 
write the new excavations, um, I've been fortunate that I've gotten uh, reports from uh, Ben Aptiz and from uh, Cohen, I guess, in some degree, from the Congo King project in general on what they've been doing and how they've been doing it and what they've been finding. And I think that probably uh, it's time now to revisit uh, the very dense documentation of the Nkisi Valley that we have between about 1690 and about 1710. Um, with, with Marcelino Dantri, uh, Luca de Galvani Seta, Bernardo de Gallo, who all traveled there, talked about what was going on, and gave us a lot of information about things like the movements of buildings and, and settlements and so on. And we have to sort through that in a more nuanced way than we have up till now. Uh, second thing that might be noted is the, the Cuvelier papers in Dufin, uh, Cuvelier and people working with him, spent a lot of time looking at old village sites and trying to locate them on the maps and uh, figuring out what they were about. And just from hearing Pierre speak about the, the deforestation and that sort of process, I have a feeling that a lot of those old sites have been disturbed, if not destroyed. And, but they might still be recoverable, although granted the Cuvelier's papers are not geo-referenced, uh, not lacking a GPS back there in the 1940s and so when he was doing his research. But he also collected oral tradition, and that stuff um, is probably buried in his many cahiers, which I encountered and had only two hours to look at about 50 of them. Uh, Cuvelier graced us by writing his work in Dutch sometimes, and French sometimes, and in Kikongo sometimes, and sometimes switching from one language to the other. Uh, so you're always sort of stuck with a linguistic uh, haze while working on that project. Uh, so I think that we, we can get a lot more than that. I'm, I'm really, I mean, it's very exciting right now because um, I was just doing a little math and I realized that uh, I became a seriously, fanatically committed to the Kingdom of Congo 44 years ago. Uh, and I can remember long times having my like, sweet dreams of somebody doing archaeology, um, sweet dreams of somebody really, you know, digging into this region the way so many other African regions have been explored archaeologically. And seeing that not happen, and not happen, and not happen, and not happen. Um, and now we have, finally, serious excavations being undertaken at Mbantu um, When Linda Haywood and I visited Mbantu in 2002, uh, the city was effectively in ruins. All the public buildings had been destroyed. Well, not destroyed. I mean, I had meetings with people in Linda in, in buildings where there was a wall missing, but we were there in an office, and everything was going on. There was a wall missing. Um, there were dead tanks on the, on, the, uh, on the site, and there were soldiers all around <coughs> making photography uncomfortable. Um, and you could, it, to me, it looked like one of those medieval tells, uh, ancient tells from Iraq or something, where there was like stuff eroding out of the ground. Uh, and some of it looked old. Not being an archaeologist, I didn't want to say that. Although I did propose um, in a meeting in 2007 that the, they enlist school kids to go and find pot shards and give them location information um, as a way of doing survey archaeology. I also suggested, this is a, another scheme of mine, was that the mine field clearing operations, uh, Angola, I understand, is second only to Afghanistan in density of minefields. Uh, and when I was back in Mount in 2011, I saw mine clearing companies. Well, oh, let them do some survey archaeology while they're doing that. This is just, you know, you see a pot shard, you know, make a note. But I guess people looking for mines are not necessarily interested in pot shards. Um, so maybe that didn't happen either. But in any case, now finally, Sonia Domain, which is my friend who I've known for uh, since I met her in 2007, she is conducting work there. Uh, she did a little survey work in 2011, I think, and, and she did some work last summer, which you guys maybe know more about than I do. Uh, one newspaper report that came out a little while ago uh, in the show of Angola, I think. Uh, announced that she had covered a stretch of wall and uh, parts of the palace and things like that. So uh, let's hope that keeps moving forward. One never knows what is moving moving forward or moving backwards in Angola in any given day. And I always await wonder that someday somebody will say, um, "This is actually happening. Here's a ticket. Come." <laughs> so it's to be on I'm on guard to have to do that. So I would like to also speak a bit to um, 
to Cecile, so which has a wonderful paper. Um, I really enjoy uh, this piece of work. And I, I just I, I can't resist the temptation to talk just a little bit about those wonderful ambassadors uh, from Congo to Brazil in, in 1642. Because it really does illustrate the nature of this the international connections of this Central African Kingdom. The background behind them uh, was the war conducted by the Portuguese uh, governor, João Correia de Souza, against Congo in 1622-23. Um, this war was uh, conducted with a high degree of treachery in the sense that uh, Correia de Souza was negotiating with Congo and his ambassadors about alleged uh, problems. At the very moment, he was mobilizing his army to attack them. Um, a surprise attack uh, in late 1622 uh, managed to defeat uh, a, a Congolese border army. Um, and the end result of that was that the <coughs> allies of the Portuguese, the Ivangala allies of them, actually forced a Congolese nobleman to clean the guts of his father so that they could beat him. Um, resulted in Congo's strong response to this, which was, first of all, the main Congolese army totally defeated this Portuguese army. And Kazi, uh, late in 1622. Pedro II, then ruling king of Congo, invaded Angola um, and drove quite deeply into the countryside before he had to call off his campaign as a result of the weather conditions that inevitably ended all military campaigns. During that time, Pedro, however, also did something which was quite remarkable. He wrote to the king of Spain, who was the nominal sovereign of the kingdom of Portugal. He wrote to the pope. And he wrote to the Stats General in the Netherlands. Um, as a result of that correspondence, the Portuguese <coughs> government agreed to return 1,250 slaves from Brazil um, as a, hopefully, to keep them off their backs because he had an army advancing into, into Angola. Um, and secondly, um, the governor was relieved of his command uh, and died on his way back to um, Portugal. I was wondering about these people guy that way. Uh, and the third thing was the States General received from him an elaborate plan, which was actually a part of the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. This plan was that Congo would pay the Dutch government to send a fleet to attack Rwanda, and Congo would attack Overland, and that this would result in the capture of the Portuguese fort there. Pedro, in his letter to the, to the Dutch States General, specified that he wanted them to send four or five ships and 500 soldiers. He would pay in gold, silver, and ivory. Um, and in effect, um, the, uh, the way I read this anyway is that the Dutch Republic became a proxy fighter for the Kingdom of Congo. Um, just as, for example, various central uh, German armies were paid for by the Dutch. So I said, okay, it's the same, same old, same old there. In any case, that long process um, resulted in, first of all, a failed first Dutch attempt to take Rwanda with Congo help didn't transpire. Um, and an interesting conflict even then, um, when the Congolese refused to grant, it's a complicated service, I'm not going to relate, their aid to the Dutch in 1624, they did say that uh, they were concerned about being a Catholic country making war on a Protestant country. <coughs> Those negotiations eventually did continue and it resulted in a Dutch attack on Rwanda in 1641, which was successful. Congolese army did intervene. And those diplomats, which you saw in, um, in the Sifi, were a part of that much larger process. Um, so they're coming there, speaking in Latin. Um, and I might add, the Dutch found them a bit onerous because they drank so much. Um, and having been to conferences in Congo and noticing that people do drink and dance great deal, even academics. Um, even me, as a matter of fact, that I was called in to participate in It's not what I thought it was an academic conference, but I'm hoping that we can bring that spirit here. That, 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 that.